back to my headquarters to organize new defense line or counterattacks. Driving slowly through Kani, I suddenly saw a single anti-aircraft battery of the Air Force with their guns in the air. I ran over to the CO and informed them about what I have seen. And I gave clear order to get immediately involved in this battle by fighting the British tanks. But I got a flat refusal telling me that he was on the air command and had nothing to do with our battle on the ground. So I took my little pistol and asked him whether he would like to be killed immediately or get a high decoration. He decided for the latter. So he got a clear order to get in position with his battery in the northwest corner of Kangi, not to deal with the advancing tanks, but with the following tanks coming from northeast. Coming back to my headquarters in Frinderville, I got my first small information about the situation. The CEO of the second battalion informed me that he had to face some small attacks from the west and that he could build out from his block positions a screen facing west. So I gave him immediately order to build up such a screen from the north to about Demobile, uh, Mandeville. Then I came in contact with the division headquarters and informed the CO of the division about the situation. I told him that I was very afraid about the open flank direction Vimont and whether he could give me any reserves to close this gap. But he told me that that was not possible because both the battalions, the Reiki battalion and the injured battalion were in position on the Burgobus Ridge to protect the artillery and anti-tank battalion positions behind the Burgobus Ridge. From this very moment on, the SP battalion of Major Becker was the only unit with anti-tank to help us. So this was how Colonel von Luck had disposed his forces, and these were the arcs of fire available to his anti-tank guns. It was still early in the day. Third tanks had crossed the first railway line and were swinging west of Le Manif Fremontel. The following unit, the Fife and Fourfire Yeomanry, were moving to the east of the village. From their concealed positions, the assault gunners, trained to act on their own initiative within a general order, allowed the leading squadrons to pass. When C Squadron was in their sights, they opened up. In seconds, 12 out of 19 tanks were burning. Major General Roberts, commanding 11th Armoured Division, was moving up to control the battle from near Le Mani from Ontario. Uh, perhaps you would like to consider what you would do as commanding officer when having not heard from your rear squadron for a, 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 a short time, you don't get them on the air, and you look back, and you find that they all seem to be knocked out. Some of them are burning, and some of them the crews are bailed out from, at any rate, they're non-operation. Now, a little bit after this had occurred, I had come forward in my tech headquarters, and I had, uh, myself gone to Brigadier Harvey, who was in uh, the outskirts of Le Menil Fremontel there. A lot of mortar fire was coming down, so I got onto the back of his tank to inquire exactly what the situation was. And as I was there, I heard that it was the intention of the CEO of the Fife and Fourfire Yeomanry to get his motor company on their feet and to attack Kenya. Bearing in mind that I had particularly asked that we should not have to take Kenya, and bearing in mind that our objectives were further over in the right flank, I did not want to start getting involved on the left flank, as the guards were coming forward and they were going to take over Kenya. 
So I told Brigadier Harvey to cancel that order. Now, you've already heard from Colonel von Luck how Candy was held virtually by only those four ACAC 88 guns. So how unfortunate was it that I had that order cancelled because the motor company on its own could easily have cleared up the village in a very short time. While C Squadron, the Fife and Forfa, were being engaged by the combined fire of the mutually supporting anti-tank guns in and to the east of Le Mani from Hotel, third tanks were moving west of the village. I stopped and looked through my glasses as we got close to the village and I could see considerable activity among the walls and the houses and it was pretty obvious that the village was fairly strongly occupied. I wanted to stop and use my squadron properly and put down a shoot but I was being told by my CO in no uncertain terms to get on, get moving and go to the west of the village. As I crossed over that fairly open country there was some AP shot 88 millimeter coming from the areas of Cagney and Lipria and it was quite extraordinary. They were overs and had no effect on my tanks and as they came across the top of the corn you could actually see them coming as they left a wake rather like the wake of a torpedo and you could in fact take evasive action. As we crossed over from the Menon Fermentel, we were then moving beyond the range of all but our own self-propelled track guns, the priests, which were with us. The whole of the third tanks passed to the west of Le Menon Fermentel and motored on down towards Grantonville, which was the next village further on. Up to this point, we had had a fairly reasonable swan except for the few casualties sustained by the left-hand squadron. I should like to deal very briefly with the operations of 159 Infantry Brigade, who, you will recollect, had the task of taking the villages of Coverville and Demerville. I don't want to go into much detail. Suffice to say, the whole thing went very slowly. But it was at 10.30, that Coolville was cleared. And then shortly afterwards, an order came from Corps that it was not to be unoccupied until handed over to a battalion from the 51st Highland Division who were originally holding the front line in this bridgehead over the Orne, and they would come forward and take it over. There were delays in that. Demerville was not cleared until 1515 hours. And by, by the time that was handed over, it was 1,700 hours before they were released from that task and uh, were available to me for other operations. At this fairly early stage in the operations, I was really ca uh, quite happy with the situation, except that in the rear, where a little trouble had developed. The Fife and Fire had lost the squadron, but their leading squadrons were pressing on between Salier and Four. 3RTR had bypassed Le Menil Fremontel and were crossing the Corps Vimor Railway. Ten of those hours were a bit tied up around La Priere, but with the guards coming up, I could extricate them as soon as they arrived. So, according to our information of the enemy's positions, we were about three quarters of the way through the fixed defences. In fact, the 11th Armoured Division, with the Guards Armoured Division following closely behind, was only one quarter of the way through, with the enemy redeploying skillfully as the changing situation demanded. Before the capture of Le Pire, Major Becker had withdrawn his number five battery to Le Poirier. Likewise, before the fall of Le Mani from Antel, he had moved number four battery to southeast of Four. Number two battery at Giberville was moving back to Iberfolie, with number three battery still in Granteville. The anti-aircraft guns in Cagny were about to delay the guards while the Fife and Forfa were moving only slowly forward after the shock of the ambush. Some Tiger and Mark IV tanks were now operational and moving to join Colonel von Luck at his headquarters in Frenouville. 
he had every reason to be satisfied with his position as third tanks were approaching the second railway line. As I reached the little cornfield a few hundred yards from Gromfenville, we were engaged by anti-tank guns from the forward edge of the village, and some of the tanks from my troops on the left, about four of them, went up in flames. I could also see several of the tanks further left in the left-hand squadron were also brewing. There was quite a lot of AP shot, which was coming from the bushes and trees in Gromfenville, and also where the farm buildings are. Obviously, anti-tank guns in very well-concealed positions. And within a matter of moments, there were five or six tanks brewing up. I told my two right-hand troops to tuck themselves down along the line of the embankment and get some HE fire on the forward edges of the village as quickly as possible. I had an OP with me right from the start, who was in a sawn-off honey, and I had given him instructions to stick close to me. I tucked myself in behind a small ridge, called him over, and told him, for Christ's sake, get a stonk down on as quickly as possible. All this time, I was being told in no uncertain manner by my CO to get over to the west side of the embankment. And I said, wait out until I can get a stomp down on the village. My two right-hand tubes had, in the meantime, engaged several anti-tank guns and assault guns in this area. They claimed to have knocked out two or three anti-tank guns and at least one assault gun. I could see that the embankment was going to be rather a difficult problem, and I did not like the idea of going over the top, broadside on, within a few hundred yards of anti-tank guns. Also in this area, out in the cornfields, were lots of naval buffers who were in the process of firing over our heads. We disposed of these by either running over them or blasting them with our small arm guns. I wanted to get my two right-hand troops to the western side of the embankment before I followed with the regimental group behind me. So I gave orders for them to move. Not a tank moved. Nothing happened at all. So I stood up in my tank, took off my belly, waved it three times round my head, and said over the air, conform to me. As I approached the embankment, my feelings were extremely mixed. I was not quite sure what to expect, and I was very apprehensive of whether there would be any mines. In the event, there weren't. And I shot through the hole rather like a rat up a drain pipe. I emerged on the other side to see this beautiful country looking perfectly peaceful. There was no sign of any movement whatsoever and I was an extremely relieved squadron commander, I can assure you. My squadron came underneath fairly quickly after me. I went out towards the line of the hedgerows, just short of the Cormel's factory area, and I halted there, while the rest of my squadron came up. We tucked ourselves in along the hedgerow, and then I had a jolly good look through my glasses at Blair, Hubert Folly, and Eves. The rest of the regimental group then came under the embankment to join me. With third tanks and G Company safely through the embankment and surveying an apparently peaceful stretch of country, it occurred to Colonel Silvertop, commanding third tanks, that it was necessary to establish if the village of Huberfolie, standing in the path of his next planned advance, was defended. At this juncture, it so happened that my platoon headquarters half-track vehicle was some three yards distance from the gallant colonel. And fixing me with those steely eyes, he beckoned me over and said, boy, uh, we must find out whether Hubert Folly is occupied. Jolly good idea, sir, I said, or something equally fatuous. How do you propose to do it? You're going to do it, came the reply. And as I swallowed, the ever-reassuring Noel Bell appeared at my elbow. The plan, like all good plans, was extremely simple. 
I was temporarily to command a section of the carrier platoon and drive hell for leather down the main street of the village. If we fail to appear, the chances are